Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Adventures in Brain Injury Podcast. This adventure is brought to you by Revive Treatment Centers, a multidisciplinary neurorehabilitation clinic located in Denver, Colorado. They specialize in neurorehabilitation from stroke, concussion, brain injury, neurodegenerative disease, or neurological autoimmunity, and much more. Learn more about them at revivecenters.net. We are also currently looking for sponsors, so if your company provides excellent neurorehabilitation or brain optimization, awesome food products or supplements, please get in touch with us and uh, let's see if it's a good fit. You can go to feedabrain.com forward slash support or email me directly at B at feedabrain.com. If you would like to support us monetary, if you're a listener and you're enjoying the show and you'd like to throw us a tip, uh, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash A-I-B-I for adventures in brain injury. Throw us a buck or two. It helps us so much to get this out there and to hopefully make a dent in neuro rehabilitation. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's make change, make difference. (laughs) I love it. And if you would like to leave us, another way you can support us is by leaving us a review on iTunes. Go to feedabrain.com forward slash iTunes and it'll take you right to our podcast, right? And then you click on it and leave us a review. It really helps us get the word out. We very, very, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Sue, Michelle. Kevin, what you doing in LA this week? (laughs) Yeah, so I'm in LA this week. I actually came out here to present for the World Congress on Brain Mapping and Therapeutics. So the word's getting out. It's really amazing to be doing this work and influencing neurorehabilitation and our understanding of the brain and neuroplasticity. It's awesome. And the brain needs to be fed. Yes, it does. I mean, we so need what did supplies, you tell, right? What did you tell the people? I showed them my brain scans back in October of 2016. Yes. It was was on Halloween when I had my brain scanned. Yes. And then I went through some of the therapies that I did afterward. Um, In addition to some of the things that were part of the study, which was some cognitive um, tasks, but I was doing some other cognitive tasks like building a company and (laughs) <laughs> and I was also um, writing, writing a book, writing a book, yeah, and feeding my brain and putting, doing, putting up websites, right, yeah. and doing neuro rehabilitation with with revived treatment centers, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, doing my my backflips and forward flips and vestibular rehab and all sorts of different things that I was bringing up along with vision therapy transcranial magnetic stimulation, just some really cool therapies that I was doing because I'm not, I'm not a guinea pig. I'm not isolating variables, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, feeding a brain. That was a huge aspect because we need the nutrients, which is what we're going to talk all about yes. this podcast. So I, and then I showed some structural changes after, after six months. I had my brain scanned again, or actually it was a little more than six months. It was in June, just before we met each other in person. That's right. The first time. So June 2017, um, I had my brain scanned again, and uh, it showed some structural changes. Dr. Uh, David Okonkwo was like, you know, we looked at your brain, you know, six months ago. And the first scan showed that there were some areas of your brain that fell way outside of what we think is the normal structure of the brain. Mm -hmm. And we scanned it again, and there were several areas that fall within the normal range. Which were previously outside. Yes, exactly. So this stuff works. (laughs) 
it's too soon to tell. No, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's N equals one. It's cool to see. Yeah, and of course. It's very, it's very awesome. And of course, not isolating variables. This is lots of stuff that I'm doing. But yeah, the brain's constantly changing and rewiring and improving and, you know, negative plasticity. There's different kinds of plasticity. Yes. Right? Negative and positive. But yeah, I was like, I fall in the normal range now. (laughs) How does it feel to be normal? normal. I know. I can't imagine you being normal. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways. (laughs) Get me out of here. (laughs) What I'm really excited to to talk about today is Mm -hmm. the nutrition aspect. Yes. Yeah. The micro nutrition aspect. Absolutely. Which is micronutrients are in our food for sure. From one of the lovely souls who endorsed your book with a blurb. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let me read you what Dr. Kaplan wrote. This book is going to help many readers. I applaud Cabin for doing so much research and citing so much good scientific literature to ensure that his ideas are scientifically sound and accurate. I think it is remarkable that he has used his own traumatic experience to learn how to help himself as well as others. This practical nutrition advice is a welcome addition to the field. The information is presented in such a logical, clear fashion that it should be a resource book for anyone trying to optimize their brain health with improved nutrition. Dr. Bonnie Kaplan, PhD, Emerita Professor of Medicine at the University of Calgary. Yes, and we have her on the podcast right now. Let's bring her on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Adventures in Brain Injury podcast. My name is Kevin Ballister. I'm a severe traumatic brain injury survivor who was given less than a 10% chance of recovery. I am the author of How to Feed a Brain, Nutrition for Optimal Brain Function and Repair, creator of adventuresinbraininjury.com, creator of feedabrain.com, and creator of the Feed a Brain interview series. With me is my co-host and acquired brain injury survivor, Michelle Mamberg. How are you doing, Michelle? I'm doing very well, Kevin. Thank you for having me on air again. (laughs) My pleasure. Who do we have with us today? We have Dr. Bonnie Kaplan, who I just have to note is from my hometown, about 15 minutes from my house. I'm pretty excited about this. And she's world-renowned in her research work. So I'm pretty proud about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Canadians got it going on. (laughs) (laughs) And finally, on this podcast, two Canadians outnumber that one American. (laughs) Boom, look at that. (laughs) Boom, look at that. So let me introduce Dr. Bonnie Kaplan, Professor Emerita in the Cumming School of Medicine at the University of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. But she's not really retired. And if you ever met her, you would see that there is nothing retired about her. She is all go. So here is her itinerary as she lays it out. She did all of her training in the United States, University of Chicago, and Brandeis University in experimental and physiological psychology. Her interest in the biological basis of behavior led to postdoctoral training and then faculty research in neurophysiology at the West Haven, Connecticut Veterans Affairs Hospital, Neuropsychology Laboratory, and Yale University Department of Neurology. She moved to Canada in 1979 and she's published widely on the biological basis of developmental disorders in mental health, particularly the contribution of nutrition to brain development and brain function. No wonder you two hit it off so well when you met the first time. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Kaplan's nutrition-related studies have focused on, number one, broad-spectrum micronutrient treatments for mental disorders, and two, 
the effect of intrauterine nutrition on brain development and maternal mental health. She's always been interested in the role of nutrition in brain function because her training taught her that brain metabolism is dependent upon availability of adequate nutrients. Who'd have thought? She, yeah, who'd have thought that? But she had a very tough time focusing on nutrition, in part because she found that each nutrition-related study brought out true believers and fanatics, mm -hmm. both people she did not want to be around. So then life had a turn. In 1996, she saw something she could not turn away from. She met Autumn Stringham, whose postpartum psychosis was poorly controlled with medication and who became well using a broad spectrum of minerals and vitamins. And therein lies the beginning of the story. Please, Bonnie, welcome first to Adventures in Brain Injury podcast. Thank you thank for you. joining us. Yes, thank you for having me. You're welcome. And would you please carry on with that story, you meeting Miss Autumn in September 1996? Oh, well, it's just one of those situations where when you meet someone who you know is not a true believer or a fanatic, who I had gotten quite fed up with, but <laughs> simply had a transformative experience, you know, you had to pay attention to it. Now, I didn't really think that her experience would be generalizable, and that's where research came in. So what happened was I met her one day in September 1996. She was with her father, Tony Steffen, and a man named David Hardy. These two gentlemen were from southern Alberta, and they had their own careers. They had nothing to do with nutrition, except that David Hardy had spent 20 years in animal nutrition research, so he was extremely knowledgeable about nutrition and mental health. It's just we don't think of it as mental health when we have a sick cow or an aggressive pig, right? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what it is. There are behavioral difficulties and aggression and outbursts and so forth. So he was an experienced scientist in that he was involved in studying nutrition and animal behavior and animal health for 20 years. And that was the beginning of the story. I listened to them and realized that I was hearing people who had nothing to gain from being right, but they were convinced that they had stumbled upon something. And I went searching in the literature, and this is what I found. I found, and I was shocked, I have to tell you this, I found there was about 100 years of research dating back to 1929, that was the oldest publication I could find, where psychiatrists were trying different nutrients to treat mental illness. And if you read some of the articles, you would swear that they had figured out in the 1930s that, I don't know, calcium helped people with psychosis, manganese mm -hmm. fixed some hallucinations, and so on and so on. But what characterized every single one of those studies from 1929 until the year 2000, with only two exceptions, what characterized them was this. They were testing for magic bullets or silver bullets as we call them. Each study studied one nutrient at a time. So here I came along. I know I'm giving you a long answer to this, Michelle, but I'll let you interrupt in a moment or Kevin. But I came along from this background of knowing that the brain requires all the nutrients and needs them every minute of every day that we're alive. And I couldn't believe that there had been this wild goose chase looking for magic ingredients but it continues to today there are people who still rant and rave about single nutrients so anyway i'll pause and let you well that's really important though because you're even though you say you're no longer a principal investigator you are heavily invested in pursuing well two things you tell us about the fundraising for two charitable Funds, funds, right. Yeah, right. to support the research of your younger colleagues. You've paved the road. You might as well let them travel it, who know that nutrition is key to solving the mental health epidemic. But they cannot get regular grants to support their clinical trials. So why right. is that? Well, that's exactly the topic I was just referring to, this magic bullet thinking. Uh -huh. It plagues our society. If we have an illness, we think there should be a single medication for it. And so if we have a mental health challenge, we think there should be a single 
nutrient. And so it's very easy to get a grant if you're a competent scientist with, you know, a good research design to study, say, vitamin D or to study magnesium and depression or certainly to study omega-3s. But to get a grant from any agency where you want to study the entire broad spectrum of micronutrients, which our brains need in balance all the time, you can't get it. And I'm going to tell you an anecdote that illustrates it so beautifully. One of my colleagues down in the States had submitted a grant to the National Institutes of Mental Health using a broad spectrum formula, got excellent reviews, excellent rating, and did not get funded because one of the reviewers looked at the ingredients of the formula, which had about 30 vitamins and minerals, and asked this question, which is the important nutrient? Oh, no. Now, that is a person who is so ignorant of brain metabolism and yet has this power over the public purse for funding research. And that and a couple other things that happened were the tipping point for me. And I decided uh, in 1915, as I was approaching my retirement from the university, I set up two charitable funds, one in the U.S. and one in Canada, so that people in each country can get charitable tax receipts that are okay to help them with Canada Revenue or the IRS. They're both managed by very established foundations. And with that money, may I tell you what I've been doing with it? Is that okay? In three years, you're okay. Let us know what you've done in three years. Well, it's amazing. It took about a year and a half, and I'd raised over a half a million dollars, and I never dreamt that was possible. But as you may know, clinical trials, like if you look at a clinical trial from a drug company, they cost millions and millions of dollars. But academics who are studying nutrition can be very good at penny pinching. (laughs) And so the half million dollars has been distributed to clinical trials studying broad spectrum nutrient treatment, uh, trials that are going on in three countries, Canada, the US and New Zealand. Mm. And all of that work is underway. I'm very excited about that and still looking for lots more money. I'm Right now, I'm trying very hard to find another 60000 or so for the U.S. fund, if any of your listeners are so inclined, and they can email me, kaplan at ucalgary.ca, and I can tell them what it's about, but it's one particular position that really needs funding. So... That's one of the things I tell people when I'm doing in my retirement is I'm being a philanthropist with other people's money, and it's <laughs> lots of fun. <laughs> well, that's fabulous. It really and, uh, is. I'm so excited. That, like uh, Some of the things you talked about there was, number one, nutrition and animal behavior. Like that, that is pretty well accepted, how nutrition affects animal behavior. And, you know, they're not using the word psychology. But absolutely. And yeah, I absolutely get why you might be shocked that you hadn't heard of this stuff. And then digging through the literature and seeing that it's not, I mean, have you ever seen the mineral wheel, for example? The mineral, I don't know what you mean by the wheel. It's like this diagram showing how the minerals interact with each other. Oh, I see things like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, it's a complex web of how we, use all of these compounds together for brain metabolism. And I love that you're bringing that up and doing the research for it, being a philanthropist, philanthropist with other people's money. (laughs) (laughs) It's the only way. (laughs) It's great. Well, and another one of your foci is KT or knowledge translation. So to clinics, policymakers, and to businesses, who are suffering greatly from the impact of workplace mental health problems. So there's a broad spectrum of use for your broad spectrum of nutrients, Bonnie. (laughs) That's right. May I tell you a little bit about what I'm doing in that area just in this month and next month? It's been kind of interesting to me. Please. One of the things that I have marveled at is how in the last five years, people are so much more open to the idea of nutrition being relevant for mental health. I mean, we were open to it before 1950. In fact, I'm going to give you a little historical note. So remind me what I was about to say. I'll come back to that. Yes, yes. Um, 
Uh, the other thing that I did after I met Autumn and Tony and David was I really investigated the history of mental health and nutrition. And I have a 45-minute lecture on the internet solely on that topic because I, I, the older I get, the more interested I am in history, I think. But I can trace knowledge of the role of diet for brain health back 2,600 years. But the really amazing thing is the much more recent history. Because 100 years ago, do you know what clinical practice guidelines are? Do you know that term? Is that too jargony? Maybe? Well, no. Explain it just briefly for our audience. Okay. So a lot of the specialties in the medical professions have experts review the literature and make recommendations that they call clinical practice guidelines. And they are kind of best practices. So for X, it looks like Y is the best treatment, but, you know, A, B, and C show some benefit. And so the clinical practice guidelines guide a lot of private practice clinicians. So we didn't have those 100 years ago, but the equivalent was found in something called the People's Home Library, which told people how to take care of their health, what to do about their health, etc. especially our homesteading people who weren't anywhere near a doctor. Yes. You know, yes. the people in the West. And if you look in the People's Home Library, published 108 years ago, 1910, and look for mental illness, you'll find that the primary treatment was to feed them better. What they said was the expression of those symptoms meant there was, quote, imperfect nutrition. So that's interesting. And then I'll tell you one other one that I always cite, which was a study in about 1950, starvation experiments that were done during the 40s, during World War II, when people were very interested in knowing the impact of cutting back on nutrient intake in normal, healthy people, as was happening in Europe and was happening in the concentration camps, to find out especially the physical impact. But they also studied the mental impact. And what they found and published was that cutting back in a group of normal undergraduate students at the University of Minnesota, cutting back on the nutrient intake by about 25%, I think it was by, for about 20 weeks, resulted in depression, anxiety, mania, self-harm, etc. And here's, but that isn't even the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. <laughs> no one was surprised because in 1950, it was understood that not getting enough nutrients resulted in mental illness and that the solution was to improve nutrient intake. But then along came the psychopharmacology revolution, especially, you know, starting in about the 70s, and we became a real pill-taking society and people just, you know, forgot what they used to know. So that was my historical digression. Now, do you remember where I was? <laughs> oh, I know. It was to tell you about the lectures I'm giving right now. So I am so interested that we seem to be returning to the 1950s. People are aware again of the relationship between nutrition and mental health and brain health. And so I happened to see an ad for an employee assistance program on January 31st, which, Kevin, you wouldn't know this probably, but in Canada, Bell Canada, the company, has made January 31st the Let's Talk Day. Let's talk yes. about mental health. And a lot of businesses, which are hit very hard by mental health problems, take it very seriously, and they have lectures and talks and try to change the culture of acceptance and reducing stigma and everything. It's wonderful. So I saw they were having this seminar, and I emailed and said, would you like to hear a talk on nutrition? And they said yes, which oh, 10 years ago would not have happened. And so at that first talk with about 100 people in the audience from all the different companies around here, that has resulted in six or eight, or I've lost count, of these companies coming to me afterwards and asking me to go to their companies and speak to them about workplace mental health and workplace nutrition. And I'm doing those throughout March, April, May, into June. And it's so much fun because these people really want to know. That's absolutely Fantastic. brilliant. You know, Bonnie, it's so exciting because I noticed the Let's Talk campaign on the billboards mm -hmm. uh, last year. And I noticed that this year it was much bigger and broader. So very clearly there was a positive impact 
and they had found it worthwhile not only to continue but to grow it so i'm glad that it's actually reaching out into the corporate workplace and our multiple olympian in both summer and winter olympics clara hughes was leading the campaign with her face on that billboard. She was the spokesperson. Right, right. Now, I have not spoken to her, but um, speaking with me at this first EAP meeting was uh, one of our other Olympic gold medalists, Chandra Crawford. And um, she's been very interested in this topic, but makes me think I should try to find out how to reach Clara Hughes. Well, Clara, oh, make it or you should, yes. Okay. <laughs> so now that we have mental health, we're going back to the 50s in one way, in some ways, and people are actually recognizing that nutrition affects the brain, and we're getting mental health and nutrition together again. How is this understanding evolving? Are people beginning to understand this? You know, such a complex question, Kevin, because I think people are understanding it, and yet all the statistics are going in the wrong way in that more and more people are eating out instead of cooking. I just saw the figures for the U.S., actually, 2.5% increase in restaurants in just four quarters, 12 months nationwide. That's a lot of restaurants. I actually saw it in an article that was saying they were having labor problems. There aren't enough people to work in these. Yes. So anyways, the indicators are not good and the, the increase in mental disorders is really shocking. And yet I'm finding an increased openness. I'm also speaking to clinical psychologists in the area and giving lectures around. Well, I've always been giving lectures around the world, but it's nice that Albert is catching up, Michelle. Oh, isn't <laughs> <And they're>, it true? <laughs> so, I don't know. It's very complicated. Some forces are in the right direction and some are not. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're trying to fund the research to support this relationship between nutrition and mental health. Can you talk right. about well, that? I will because... Some people would say we don't need that much more support. There are over 35 peer-reviewed right. publications on showing broad-spectrum formulas, and there are two that are the most studied, but there's a third category I'll mention in a minute. But basically that they have tremendous benefit for people with any kind of brain health problems. Can you tell us what those are? Yeah, I, I should. I'm remembering who I'm talking to here, Kevin and Michelle. There is not any useful study yet on brain injury. There is one case report that I did that's fascinating involving a man who'd had severe brain injury, but as I recall, he was already seven years post-injury when he learned about the broad-spectrum formulas, and the remaining symptoms he had were not the yeah, not what you might think of as the primary brain injury. They were the emotional regulation issues mm -hmm. that we see in mental health, right? Absolutely. Yes. And, and I wanted to say that, like, like adventures in brain injury, this is, brain injury is how we both came into this, but we're talking everything related to the brain. So let's. Yes, we are. We are. Brain health. Brain. Yeah. So anyway, in that case study, we showed over 12 months Actually, it only took four weeks, but we followed him for 12 months, and he really became completely well. But the areas with the strongest, that, that's a, a very systematic, quantified case study. But the areas that have uh, group studies and placebo-controlled, randomized trials, etc., are mood dysregulation and ADHD in children associated with mood dysregulation. There is one clinical trial in adults with bipolar disorder that is, has just started. That's one of the ones that I funded from our charitable funds. But we use the term mood dysregulation when, to mean, you know, maybe not actually diagnosed bipolar disorder, but clearly ups and downs. Certainly. Yeah. And if anybody wants a list of those publications, again, they can email me. I'll be happy to send it to the two of you. So there yeah, is we'll a lot of research. Notes. And then there's this third area. I'll, I just want to mention, I said there are two formulas 
that are being studied all over the world. They're both from Al developed in Alberta, and they're broad spectrum, and they are similar to each other. But then the third category that really we should not overlook, and I've studied this myself, and that is the value of B-complex. Mm. Just taking B-complex in a person who's under stress can really improve their resilience and it's been shown in approximately eight clinical trials around the world and we actually had some surprising data right on it right here in Alberta. May I tell you about one of the studies? Please. So this was a study, I have to give you the context, Julia Rucklidge, who was at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand, has the most active research program in the world right now on the broad spectrum formulas that were developed here in Alberta. And she was in the middle of clinical trials when their first major earthquake struck in, um, let me get this right, September of 2010. And they had terrible earthquakes. They had, over the space of five months, they had 8,000 minor earthquakes. And then in the fifth month, February of 2011, they had a second really devastating one that destroyed a third of downtown and killed a few hundred people, etc. So it was five months of really brutal life in this town. And she was in the middle of doing clinical trials of the Alberta Broad Spectrum Formulas. So she did a whole series of studies. And what she found in a nutshell was that people who were taking the formula, whether they had a diagnosed mental disorder or not, when they were taking one of the broad spectrum formulas, they were really much more resilient in terms of depression and anxiety than people who were not taking them. So then, now she didn't study B-complex, but then along came the flood in Alberta, remember, <laughs> Michelle? <laughs> yes, in 2013. 2013, June of 2013. Now, we had a totally different situation. It was, again, a natural disaster, but it was one. It wasn't five months of 8,000, but it was a single event in a community where people were very well supported, devastating nonetheless. Yes. So Julia and I decided, well, what, you, what really happened, here's the behind the scenes <laughs> story, and she called me and said, Bonnie, you've got to go to Mayor Nenshi and say, tell him to hand out you know, nutrients to the population. And <laughs> after we stopped laughing, because somehow we knew that wouldn't fly, we said, well, let's do an Alberta-based study. So we did a study in which we quickly got ethics approval. We used all of her measures and her databases that had been set up in New Zealand, but we, you know, recruited and collected people here. And we found adults who were under enormous stress, didn't want to go on medication, and we randomized them to one of three groups. One group got a single nutrient, which, as you know, I think of as a magic bullet. But in this case, it was 1,000 IUs of vitamin D, which can be very useful. Obviously, we need vitamin D. Okay. The second group got a multinutrient of formula, which was B-complex. Okay. And the third group got one of the broad-spectrum formulas, which was mm -hmm. 30 vitamins and minerals. Okay. And here's what we found. The groups that got either B-complex or broad spectrum were so much more resilient in just a matter of, I think it was six weeks. It was amazing. But there was no difference between the two. Oh. So these were not clinically diagnosed people with depression or anxiety. They were people under great stress. And so B-complex, I'm convinced, is underappreciated. And when we had the Fort McMurray fires, was that two years ago, a year and a half ago? Yes, yes. I went to all the authorities that time and said, <laughs> look at what we found. Can you at least hand out B-complex? And they said no. Mm. Oh, so we're not mm. there yet with the policymakers, but right. we're working on it. Well, that's, uh, that's amazing how you're, you're finding all these studies, finding the individual nutrients, you know. With the writing of How to Feed a Brain, I go for food first and foremost because I, I tend to think that we don't know all the nutrients out there and it just makes more sense to me to actually get them the way we evolved getting them from food. And it's, but it's really, we're, we are absolutely on the same page with like, you need to get all of these nutrients to feed your brain. And so let me interrupt. And Bonnie, what was the result of having the multi-complex delivered to these people under flood stress? Oh, as I said, they all got significantly better. 
in uh, terms of depression and anxiety. But they were not pre-diagnosed. No, no, these were not, no. a, it wasn't a clinical sample. It's just that all of us have stressful periods in our lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let me address what Kevin just said, because in some ways it's the most profound issue, in my opinion, and relates to how I'm speaking about this to lots of people. I absolutely agree. There are over a thousand phytonutrients, and we don't even know what they do. Mm -hmm. But we know that if we're eating fruits and vegetables, we're getting them, and we're not getting them in a mineral vitamin formula. You know, you've heard of some of them, lutein and lycopene and so forth, but there are so many of them. We don't even know what they do, but we have evolved to need the plants that we eat, and so there must be some reason for them. So you're right, Kevin. Now I'm going to argue the other side (laughs) because it's complicated. Yes, well, that's why you are here. Okay, so... You know, I absolutely say to everyone, first, improve your diet. There's such good data Mm -hmm. showing that if you improve your diet, you decrease your depression and anxiety. And by improve, I mean eating real food. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about selective diets, excluding this, excluding that. I mean, if you're gluten sensitive, you'll figure it out and you'll exclude gluten. If you're dairy sensitive, you know, figure it out. And if you're sensitive, exclude it. But I'm talking about, for whatever you're not sensitive to, eating whole foods and cooking properly and eating basically a Mediterranean type diet, fruits, vegetables, fish twice a week, uh, assuming you eat fish, whole grains, nuts and seeds, olive oil. What did I leave out? Oh, legumes and beans, the cheapest way to improve your diet. Learning how to cook dried beans and lentils in interesting ways. You can eat very, very cheaply. So that's what we should do first. But the other side of it is, do we know what's in our food? And I have some data that are not published yet, but I'll tell you about them, but they're going to depress you. Do you want to be depressed? <laughs> that's okay. I, I took my B vitamin this morning. Good. <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> so there have been quite a few studies on nutrient content of our food, and they're hard to do, but the better ones, in my opinion, do suggest that what used to be in an apple or in a cup of broccoli is not there as much as it was 50, 100 years ago. Yes. And so if that's true, you have to ask why. And that comes down to where we get our nutrients. So I'm going to give you your listeners a little lesson because I've discovered not everybody knows this. Yes, please go ahead. We have plants and the plants are in soil. Hmm. And what the plants take out of the soil, and this is what a lot of people don't know, is they take minerals. They absorb minerals from the soil. What do plants do with it? They synthesize vitamins. What happens with us then? We come along and we eat the plants, which are smarter than we are. We can't synthesize vitamins. (laughs) So we eat the plants and we get the vitamins and the minerals. Or we eat the animals that eat the plants and we get the vitamins and the minerals. And that's how our entire system has evolved. And of course, I've simplified it. I haven't talked about photosynthesis, the role of the sun, etc. But anyway. But it comes down to the soil. Thank you, Kevin. It comes down to the soil. So for years I've been saying... I'm very concerned because it seems to me that whenever I ask farmers what they're putting back in the soil, they're putting the same things that I put on my front lawn, which is NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, Mm -hmm. potassium. Mm -hmm. But where are we getting the zinc and the copper and the manganese and the calcium and the magnesium and the molybdenum and the selenium and the boron? Where are we getting these things? Those 82 minerals that are within the Earth's crust. I don't know where you got that number 82, Michelle. Tell me. <laughs> it just, I, you know what, Bonnie, through my own learning and research, too, on how to recover, it's like, okay, so we are of the Earth. The Earth is made of multiple tens and tens and tens of minerals. So clearly, what are we doing without them? Hmm. Michelle, if you have a reference that it's 82, and Mm -hmm. especially if it has the list, would you send that to me? I will. Okay, so recently, an agricultural expert who I know in Winnipeg, 
called me and said, Bonnie, would you like to look at some soil assays? Ah. Ah. And to make a long story (laughs) short, he ended up giving me a random sample of 40 soil assays from the four western provinces, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And I then, and he gave me the norms, what should be in the soil, and I then graphed them. And it's very disturbing because they divide, they use terms in agriculture of macronutrients and micronutrients in a different way from what we use in human health. But yes. basically the macros are the ones that are that are very really determine whether a plant's going to grow or not because they're there in large amounts like calcium and magnesium and so forth and and potassium and nitrogen and and phosphorus and then the micros though are some of the ones i mentioned like copper and zinc and iron etc and i have graphs as i say i haven't published them yet although i'm working on a manuscript and in most cases less than 10 percent of the samples met the minimum standard for content so if it's not in the soil how is it getting into the plants and then in february we had a conference in winnipeg actually with it was all food producers agricultural experts and i kicked off the day-long seminar or two days actually by talking about the importance of minerals for brain health and then they all talked about how we need to improve and what is being done with biostimulants and organic methods to improve minerals in the soil, etc. And mm-hmm. so, but they are the minority. Most industrial farming, they're not paying attention to this yet. Bonnie, I grew up on NPK. You need the NPK. And mm-hmm. I mean, much to the credit of my father, he was espousing precisely what he had learned so well in his agricultural studies at the university. And he and I, at a very young age, I had to agree to disagree with him because when I was out making mud patties in in the soil on the edge of the field where the irrigation pivot ended its toss of rain, I couldn't find any earthworms. Oh. And I just thought, well, what's wrong? Why is it different here in the field than it is in the garden where we grow our vegetables Mm -hmm. for the farm and for the root cellar? I find it really interesting that when we talk about macro and micronutrients in the soil, Uh uh, so that's different. Can you give us an overview of what macro and micronutrients in the soil look like? Well, they were the ones that I I gave you. Maybe I'll do a contrast, Kevin, as to how the terms are. I don't know how if your listeners are really interested in this, but they probably know that macronutrients in human health are things like proteins, carbohydrates, fats. Micronutrients are things that we need in small amounts like vitamins and minerals. And there's disagreement as to whether or not essential fatty acids should be in the category of micronutrients, but there are some very senior biologists who say that not only are they, but also amino acids are Mm. in the micronutrients. So even in in health, there's not (laughs) clear use of the terms, but macro and micro in agricultural context, the big ones, you know, enable the plants to grow. If you have enough calcium, potassium, nitrogen, etc., your plants are going to grow and look pretty healthy. But if you don't have the micronutrients, it's not so good for us. It's, uh-huh. And those are the things like the zinc, the trace minerals like boron, selenium, etc. So macro would be the NPK. And then yeah. Micro would be the Everything 82 else. <laughs> other, or whatever, the 79 other ones yeah. um, that, you know, if 82 is the number we're talking. Uh So anyway, but it's very inspiring to hear what people are doing because it turns out that if you really improve the health of your soil and improve the health of your plants, you can decrease or eliminate pesticides and herbicides, etc. Yes, yes. How can we bring back in the micronutrients into the soil? Oh, literally putting them in. I mean, they're just mixed in with fertilizers. So it would be like broad spectrum micronutrients for the soil. Yes, that's right. (laughs) Uh Yeah, it does does sound funny, doesn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Well, and there was a really big emphasis a couple of years ago. There were a number of seminars being hosted using fish-based fertilizers. Yes. Because, Because it's the ocean which 
produces are salts, and the salts have these 82 rock salt, Himalayan rock salt is, claims to have 84 minerals. So it's our waters that have, our ocean waters, which have the mineral content, and then the fish, of course, live in this environment. So anything from the ocean, now let's not get into what we've been doing to our oceans, but let's just think pure and pristine, we take from our oceans, take these fish, so the fish species and the leftover, you know, fish from natural end of life cycles are taken and thrown onto the fields because the fields did rise from the oceans. And guess what happens? It increases the micronutrient profile of the soil. And then of course that enriches the plants, enriches the animals who dine on those plants all the way up that cycle. But the problem is now I, there's such a push on social media, especially I've been seeing hydroponics and aquaponics and mm -hmm. You know, those of us who have grown up celebrating the biosynthesis and, and the synergy between plant and land, I'm a little wary about this. Bonnie, do you have a comment on water-grown foods for humans? Not really. I did hear a lot of praise for fish as fertilizer as being mm -hmm. very healthy for the soil, but I don't think I can say anything more intelligent than that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I well just aquaponics think is actually raising aquatic animals in a farming environment where you're getting the excrement and the fish products. You know the aquaponics. You know, and yeah. so I'm I'm interested in that style of farming. It's pretty interesting, but yeah. But we don't eat what they eat, Kevin. They're and eating also soy and corn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's farmed fish. Yes, yeah, so. so we've got an issue yeah. there. So let's go back to what we want to speak with Bonnie with about these promotional nutritional products. I mean, shall we say the name of what's being developed here in Alberta? You know, I always get uncomfortable about it because people okay. think I work for the companies. They think that of every one of the researchers in, you know, there are studies going on on the Alberta formulas in Canada, in the U.S., in New Zealand, and now a newly funded European trial. They're all using the Alberta formulas, and we all get accused of taking money from the companies, and none mm -hmm. of us ever takes a dime from the companies. We don't let them fund our research, which, mm -hmm. is, which is why we need to raise money for our research. Right. But um, we're all really, all of us studying nutrition are quite disgusted with how the pharmaceutical companies have corrupted the mental health literature over the last 50 years, and they just have poured money into it and distorted the data and you know, some of the trials are being recalled now and the publications are being recalled. So we just don't want any part of it. It's not that, I'm sorry if it sounds high and mighty, but we just don't want that to happen with nutrition. It makes mm -hmm. me kind mm -hmm. of ill. No, so thank I you can, so much for that. And actually, can you give us some yeah. examples of how the pharmaceutical industry is corrupting oh. the research? <laughs> sure. I mean, they have funded clinical trials to the tune of millions of dollars and basically run them and then just give money to physicians, uh, psychiatrists, and ask if they would be willing to let their names be on the paper. And I know that's true because I was in a medical faculty. I got one of those letters once. They didn't mm. realize I was a PhD, not an MD. And they would pay me to have my name on a scientific study. Is that sick or what? Right. But also, they have suppressed negative findings. They've distorted data analyses. And the most famous one is the Paxil. Paxil is an amazing study. I, for, I have to preface this by saying that I am not anti-medication. My ideal world would be that everyone would first improve their nutrition. Secondly, if they still need to, and there's good reason to think some people will need to, they would take micronutrients on top of that. And only third and last ditch would be medication, but some people will need it. In other words, medication would be a supplement. That's one of the reasons I don't call nutrients supplements. Mm. We need nutrients. Mm. And medication should be the supplement. And medication wow. is clearly useful for many people in crisis, short-term use. There's more and more data coming out that long-term use is not as promising and, in fact, is harmful. And a lot of people do not know that they are 
taking medications that have been studied for six to 12 weeks, to the yes. best of my knowledge, never longer than mm -hmm. 12 weeks, approved by FDA based on six to 12 on weeks. Long -term considered long-term study. Uh, that's 12 weeks, right? Yeah. And then their doctor has been told by the pharmaceutical companies, tell, to, I, apparently, this is what I'm told by physician friends, tell them it's like insulin. They have to take it for the rest of their lives. Well, right. nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. And there are now some randomized trials, including one from Holland that showed very clearly that even people with a psychotic break who were randomized to the condition where they would be weaned off of their medications over time fared much better than those who were randomized to the condition where they kept on their medications. Mm. So anyway, but the Paxil story is a really sad one, very sad one, because it was published in Lancet, I want to say... I'm not sure, but I, I think it was more than 10 years ago. And these clinical trials, they have to have two of them to get market approval by FDA. And so it was one of the trials for market approval for using Paxil in children and adolescents. And a group of scientists has gotten together and formed a consortium to reevaluate a lot of the clinical trials on psychiatric medications. And they, they took Paxil first. I know I have many psychiatrist friends who say they will not use that. They've seen terrible problems with it. And what this consortium found and published was that the drug companies had interpreted their data as showing efficacy and safety. And in fact, it was neither efficacious nor safe. Mm -hmm. And there are many cases of suicide and homicide of people who have gone on to Paxil. And yeah, it's and, very sad. And, uh, and most of those SSRIs do contain disclaimers that if you have suicidal thoughts or actions, please call your doctor. But I mean, who's reading that small print? And why are we putting people who are at risk of suicide on medication that may induce suicide? Exactly. Or homicide. We have a very famous case here in Canada. Uh, now, this wasn't Paxil. I, don't, I actually don't remember what medication he was given. But David Carmichael, he speaks and writes openly about this, mm -hmm. that he became totally convinced in a psychotic break triggered by an antidepressant that his son would be better off dead. Uh -huh. And he killed his son. Wow. His very beloved son. And yeah. yeah, you can, he just recently wrote about it in, on the Madden America website. If you wanted to yes, Google his right. name, you'd yeah, find that's it. Right. Well, yeah, his, um, Dr. Kelly Brogan uh, writes a lot about that as well. And, right. And Peter yeah. Bragan has written whole books um, on it. It's, yeah. it's really disturbing. But, and, you know, and you were saying, even in the fine print, it's like, consult your doctor if you have suicidal ide or homicidal ide ideations. And then, you know, what happens when you consult your doctor with that? They're going to put you on another medication, likely. Well, that yeah. might be okay. I mean, I still feel there's a place for medication, Kevin. Mm -hmm. But uh, the real problem, I think, is that people say that they don't realize that it's the drug that has caused the problem. They yes. think it's the problem. It, yes. This is my mental illness. And so decreasing the medication or resisting this homicidal thoughts is that's the last thing that they think of mm. i spoke recently to someone who had never had a suicidal thought and took an antidepressant and did develop that thought and had the mental wherewithal to say wait a minute this isn't me i mean yeah i have mm -hmm. some depression but this has to be the medication and he got off of it very quickly mm. but how many people recognize that no not many many are convinced that they don't know their own bodies well enough and for my brain injury adult onset pandas nobody could imagine that a an adult had strep and b an adult had strep that caused a brain injury so i was not followed properly nor was i believed and so i was given paxil but it was a joke I was told to take five milligrams a day. And then the doctors I followed up with years later, they looked at me and they said, five milligrams? That's not even therapeutic. We're talking mm -hmm. 40 to 60 milligrams. You know, and so talk about a placebo effect, really. And when I said, mm -hmm. well, I don't feel it worked, you know, oh, well, you're not taking enough. But <laughs> given the neuropsychiatric effects of pandas, how terrifying to put an SSRI with suicidal thoughts on top of 
a condition that often results in suicidal thoughts. Yeah. Um, I think you're right, Bonnie. Um, we've got to use those as supplements at the very, very bottom of the recommendation list. Yeah, let me back up and say how much I love that. Yeah. You know, supplements are nutrients. Yes. And then that medication should be supplements. I love that. Yeah, so, nutrition well, is fundamental. You know that, right? Really, absolutely. <laughs> Foundational. Foundational. So what is your, I mean, we're here about how doomsday some of this stuff is just like really messy it gets with the pharmaceutical industry and mental health and nutrition taking a back seat not getting the funding that it needs because it's not a magic bullet right it's a broad right. spectrum thing <laughs> uh-huh. so what is your vision of an ideal future well i think i've probably said it in a nutshell but i'll elaborate a little What's my future vision? That everybody will understand the important ways in which vitamins and minerals are essential in brain metabolism as cofactors and in mitochondria for energy production. These are simple concepts, and I'm teaching them to everyone at every level, including junior high school kids. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah, it's just not hard to understand that people will be learning to cook from scratch and will be challenging themselves to eat better and in addition to exercise and you know social support and all the other things that we haven't talked about but all the lifestyle stuff that is so important for leading a a happy healthy life Mm -hmm. and that medication will still be there but as a supplement Mm -hmm. but what this will require i mean here i am speaking to the lay public a lot and to businesses and to therapists But the field of psychiatry is not there yet. Mm. And the exceptions are brilliant and wonderful. And they're the people who become integrative physicians. But the majority of psychiatrists are just not ready to let go of the idea that drugs are the answer and the only important answer. And if you want to understand why that has happened in psychiatry, there's a brilliant little book by Bob Whitaker called Psychiatry Under the Influence. (laughs) And he interprets the two main factors, and I'm not going to go into it here, that Mm -hmm. has gotten to us where we are and why we are kind of up a creek in terms of getting psychiatry further on board and open to the use of nutrition. Okay. Now, he doesn't talk about nutrition, but it's relevant to what I'm saying about nutrition. So that's my ideal future. Thank you so much, Bonnie. It is amazing to have you here. I'm so glad that we met at ISCN a few years ago. And yeah, where can people learn more about you? Mm, Yes, thank you for asking that. So I do have a Facebook page for this work. It's um, simply called Nutrition and Mental Health. People can message me on there. They can email me at kaplan at ucalgary.ca. I can send out their, well, their YouTube videos and links on the Facebook page, and I can send things out by email. I'm happy to do that for anybody who wants further information. Thank you. And perhaps there are listeners who have an influence in the school, on the school council, parent council, who have a nutrition background and want to see their children learning better, who might be in charge of some of the cafeteria purchases or vending machine placements or removal from the schools. Bonnie, you would be a fabulous resource because of your credibility in the field and your long-standing years of research, decades So please, listeners, if you are interested in making change in your home, in your school, community, please, please be in touch with Dr. Bonnie Kaplan. Well, thanks to both of you. Thanks for doing this, all these podcasts. I think it's a great contribution. We appreciate your support, Bonnie. Yes, thank you. Wow. Kevin, I am so impressed with the talent that we have in my hometown. And the fact that when such a fire starter, live wire retires, she never actually really sits down. (laughs) She (laughs) is still on fire. She is going and speaking and teaching. 
and collaborating. And I'm so thrilled. It's, it's people like this whom we need to guide the next steps to research and introductions. Yes, yeah, so this There's so much Canadian pride here. I oh, know. is that what that is? Yes. <laughs> it's great. It's really great. Uh, yes, I mean, she she is. She's phenomenal. I met her at the International Symposium on Clinical Neuroscience and was just amazed. Like, she is uh, just rocking it, you know? Well, and, and she is very realistic, very grounded. She is not, as she said, the extremes, you know, one side or the other, which make her crazy. So it's wonderful to have somebody who's just, who's very grounded, very well researched and who is presenting scientific fact that's what needs to be presented and she is ensuring that it is published yep love it just yeah. just away from the fanatics and the quote-unquote true believers mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. now why don't we just pull up the science and, and you know we don't need to be true believers we need to show that this stuff actually works you know yes yes and, and uh, put an end to uh, you know i i'm not certain about you but the calls i would get i remember particularly one young woman who could feel herself sliding back into a bipolar phase and she could feel it coming and she didn't know what to do and she asked what can i do with food and her family pressure the environment, the community she was living in, the pressure was to get back on the meds just as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. And she was trying to find a way out. Mm -hmm. And so this this research is absolutely essential. It's so uh, essential, so to essential. All of those people. And, and doctor, another Canadian, Dr. Abram Hoffer, who was adamant that vitamins and minerals are what will help bring about health from mental illness. So, you know, there is so much information there, but it's just not producing as much money as the shareholders want. So we've mm -hmm. got to turn around our values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I talk a bit about how financial interests in medicine, it's like, it's the, this isn't like conspiracy theory, this is simple economics. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I go into that again, but thank you so much for being here, everyone. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode and would like to support us, uh, head over to iTunes, leave us a review, and head over to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash AIBI, and drop us a couple bucks. It really helps us out a lot. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening, learning. We appreciate the feedbacks, the emails, the comments, the messages left on the various platforms. It's exciting. We forward them to the teams we work with at Revived, other functional neurologists, guests who have been on the show, and it really helps to support, encourage, but also underscore the fact that this work is helping people. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for being here and Kevin thanks again another great <laughs> podcast recording my pleasure my well pleasure. done my friend take care Michelle thank I'll you you too soon. bye bye someone take me to a doctor